Father, we praise you and we thank you that you continue to cause our hearts and our lives to be conformed to the perfection that is found only in Christ. We ask, O oh God, that you would cause us to do your perfect will, to complete and fulfill the plan of God for this planet Earth. We know time is running short, and we can't afford to waste any time doing anything but your perfect will. And as we walk and do and perform your perfect will, you will cause us to rise, to be a blessing to the, all the nations of the world. Lord, let your coming draw me. And as we prepare ourselves and prepare those around us and prepare your church, quicken the things of the story to each one of our hearts, to each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's wonderful to know that sometimes you have to go to the nations of the world to minister in what God asks you to minister. But sometimes you can be wherever you are and yet your life can affect the nations of the world. And sometimes you are not aware of what you affect until people come and tell you. Like I realized that in a ministry in Singapore over the two years, there are people who come, sometimes some of them from all over the world, sometimes they attend one or two sessions and they go back. And uh, I remember an Egyptian sister, and uh, she's a medical doctor, and uh, she was in training in one of the Bible schools there. And uh, she used to come to the meetings, and she only came in uh, towards the latter part of the meeting. But before she left, uh, we had some fellowship, and uh, she spoke about the charismatic renewal in Egypt, and uh, talked about uh, one day having a convention there, and uh, she is associated to one of the largest churches, charismatic churches in uh, Cairo, and uh, so she, her life, she says, has been dramatically changed, and she is seeking to translate the books into Arabic. <laughs> And uh, so we never know where or what you would affect. But what, all we know is that God calls us to places, some places we don't go, but the books go, the messages still go. And uh, Jesus was faithful in, in the place of Israel on his early time. And even though Jesus lived only within the geographical area and boundaries of Israel, Yet the life of Jesus affects the whole world and every generation. So understand that the most important thing for us to do is to do God's perfect will. If God calls you to be here, be faithful. And your faithfulness will affect the world. But if God calls you to go, go. We'll pray for you and send you all. We realize that... These are the last days and it's time to do the perfect will of God. And to seek after the perfect will of God with all our hearts, lives, and being. Let's look at the book of Joel. And we see here in the prophecy about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That one of the most important things that we need to do has regard to the vision that God has. And I'm going to speak about the vision and God has given each one of us a vision to fulfill and that vision is God's perfect will for your life. And don't seek to do anything else but what God showed you to do. Number one is to have that vision. Number two is to flow with that vision. And we leave number three to afterwards when we have time. <laughs> Joel chapter two. And these are the same quotations that uh, is quoted by the Apostle Peter in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost. In the book of Joel, 
chapter 2, and uh, we'll read from verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Notice that although it's emphasized in different manners, but in three occasions the future is emphasized. I will pour out my spirit and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. We know that prophecy comforts, exalts and edifies. But at the same time when God speaks in prophecy, there's always an element of prediction and something happening in the future. That God is saying, get ready, something is about to take place. And then he say, all men shall dream dreams. Now dreams have to do again of things that are to be done, of things in the future. And then lastly we have the young men shall see visions. And those visions have to do with things that are going to happen. You see, God is interested in what is going to take place, in what is to come. And this morning I want to speak about having a vision. And then flowing with a vision. And let me emphasize when the Spirit of God comes, the vision begins in our heart. And when it is in our heart, it is in the realm that nobody else can see. I have been told many times, Say, brother, you're going to be persecuted and you're, you're going to be misunderstood because you're five years ahead of many others in, in the things of the Spirit. So that's fine. We're the cutting edge. And then I realized that having a vision... Flowing with the vision is not as easy as many people make it. Because when you have a vision, sometimes nobody else has the vision. And it is important, like Paul was talking about, or Christina was talking about how in England, they are in a state of decadence. In a, in a situation where they are cold. And uh, they, need, they only spark, but no full-fledged revival. And uh, the society at large is unaffected by Christianity. But once upon a time in John Wesley's time, it was a great nation of missionaries. What has happened to that nation now? You know why? The people who were born with a vision died and there was nobody else who had a vision. As long as there are nobody, there is nobody with a vision, decadence set in. Because it's the people with a vision that will set the pace and everyone knows that somewhere that we are going. We are going somewhere. We are not just wandering about all over in the wilderness. Without a vision, we will be only wandering in the wilderness. And as long as the generation that serves the Lord have a vision, we can guarantee that the revival will last until Jesus comes. My friends, when a vision dies and nobody else has a vision, we end up merely in the management. We end up holding on to what was in the past. We end up trying to hold together something that is already in existence, but not breaking new ground. Oh, it's so important to break new ground. Because the moment we concentrate on consolidating without pushing forward in those things that God has given us, decay starts setting in. And that's why we want to talk about having the vision. And having a vision is not easy. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the first thing that He does 
is in the realm of the invisible. See, a vision is something invisible. It's in the spirit realm. Invisible in a natural sense. You see and nobody else sees. There have been so many things that God asked to do and each time nobody else sees it and you get criticized for it, you get persecuted for it, you get misunderstood for it. And I wonder sometimes, I say, Lord, it sounds like the Old Testament. Because the people who don't see the vision, who don't get the vision, are going to ask, oh, is it possible? Are you sure about that? I don't know. We're going to look at every natural factor but not consider the spiritual factor. I know in my heart, like for example, the, the learning center, outside the learning center, I don't know, the school. Oh, I remember when it was birthed in our heart. And I remember uh, my, my daughter was given a place in a good school. Uh, and I remember, and my wife and I prayed and said, no. If we believe in the vision, we must put our own children through it. And remember, it was not easy getting anyone to believe that vision. And we remember how we had to sacrifice in order to put all the expenses in to bring that vision. Today, when the children were acting and performing, in my heart I say, it's so wonderful to see uh, at least they're taking off to some extent. But nobody knows those times when it was not easy. When there's no support from anybody for that kind of school. When there's no encouragement from anybody for that kind of school. Uh, it was not easy. But because we know the vision, we will follow it. We thank God that more people are checking the vision. And of course, there are some that we chat with who believe in the vision and straight away they send the children in. And one thing we know, having a vision has its consequences. Every person in the Bible who has a vision has to wrestle with this first factor here. You see what other people don't see. And because other people don't see what you see, they doubt, they have unbelief, and they question. So the people with the vision have to also exercise faith for themselves and for the others to carry them. Oh, my friend, let's have the vision. And perhaps in your own life, God has given you some vision, some thing to fulfill. And perhaps you have started but not completed. I believe that when you start something, it must end well. I don't believe in something half done. Which is why when the Lord tells me to start something, it will end well. I don't believe in a half-baked job. If it costs everything, make sure it's completed. Before you start, make sure you can finish it. And if only... People will know that to have a vision is to be flowing against the tide. Because you see the invisible while they see the visible. But here is where the interesting factor comes. You see there is a spiritual realm up here and then there is a natural realm. Let's illustrate with down, being down here. Everything in the natural takes place because of the spiritual realm. What happens is that when the Spirit of God pours out upon all flesh, the Spirit of God will appoint people to carry in their spirit a pregnancy period for those things that the Spirit wants to bring forth into the natural realm. And the things in the spirit realm to come into the natural realm must flow through the womb of our spirit. In every other way, it would be illegal in the law of the spirit. 
And so the Holy Spirit is excited. He's all up here in the spirit realm. He wants to do many things. I mean, there are thousands and millions of wonderful things that God wants to do down there on the planet Earth. But He cannot just break spiritual laws and intervene. So the Spirit of God looks to and fro. The Spirit of God flows and hoovers over all flesh to see which spiritual womb is capable of taking the seed of what God wants to do. And that's what happens when the Spirit of God pour upon our flesh. We get pregnant in the Spirit. We get filled in our spirit with the things that God speaks. But when you look around in the natural, there's nothing. There's nothing. But when you look in the spirit, it is there, it's a seed. And you feel it in your spiritual womb. And the spirit of God is growing on your inside. And causing you to have that vision. And something drives you, something propels you. Because you have God pregnant in the things of the spirit. What happens in having the vision? What takes place in having the vision? Number one, be prepared to flow and stream against the tide. That's what our vision is about. You see, the, the spiritual realm changes the natural realm and the natural realm is not going to change by itself. It's going to resist change. Just like human beings resist change. Oh, we have done things this way for the past 50 years. We resist change. But the things of the spirit that are impregnated into our hearts slowly give up. And it's just like, it's just like everybody is flowing a lot in like a tower of Babel. You know, we're just going everywhere, everywhere and anywhere. And, uh, and the tide is carrying us along. And then the Spirit of God comes on all flesh and suddenly you, you see the vision, you receive a vision, you have a vision. Number one, you start turning against the tide. Say, no, it is not going to be this way the rest of the time. No, this is not going to be like that in the next five years. They're going to change it. Suddenly, you're prepared to flow against the tide. And you position yourself for resistance. Because the devil will come to break that vision in your life. The devil will come to steal that vision in your life. The devil will come to divert the vision in your mind. We need to hold the vision. Just like a lady who is pregnant. What does the lady do? She, she starts taking care of the child. She starts eating properly. With more nutrition. She's eating for two now. She has to take extra care now. Of the little baby growing on, on her inside. She has to position herself for the birth of the child. And that's the same thing that takes place when the Spirit of God flows on all flesh. We are pregnant with the vision. Number one, you start going against the child. See, for England to be revived, all it needs is for one man, one woman to have that vision. But notice it here. There are a lot of miscarriages in the spirit realm. God has come many with vision, and when they turn to face the tide, the pressure is too great, and they abort the vision, they abort the child. Don't you think that God has raised up people in that land? Yes. But there was none with enough stamina to go on. I believe there are some that God is raising today. What about this land, this nation, and the nations around us? Do you have the stamina to carry the pregnancy through? 
or are you the, going to go the easy way when it's difficult about the big day? Yes, there may be inconveniences, but you put up with those inconveniences. You ask the lady who is pregnant whether it's uncomfortable now to sleep. They cannot sleep in the normal way they used to when the baby gets big. Us men, we don't understand it. But today, there are all kinds of inventions. They invented a machine that they attach to a man's body <laughs> to let him see what it's like to be pregnant. And one of the men was wearing this machine and he was trying to pick up the handkerchief. I mean, picking a handkerchief becomes very difficult too when you're pregnant. And, uh, and then the man was going this way and that way. <laughs> After the, his educational class, maternity educational class, he became very more appreciative of ladies who are pregnant. <laughs> and in the end, he couldn't pick up that handkerchief or whatever was on the floor. And you know what he did? He went near, he kicked it, and <laughs> caught it up with his hand. If a lady actually had done it, they would have done I mean, it would be different. And how many times do those pregnant ladies have to run to the toilet more often? It's pressure on their, on your body. It's uncomfortable. And then when you lie down this way, not so comfortable. That way, not so comfortable. At night when you need to sleep, nine months. First three months are easy. Oh, three months are, but, are okay. But as they grow bigger and bigger, the last two months, you lie down right, not comfortable. Left, not comfortable. You lie down straight, not comfortable. You just put pillows and cushioning. And then you're lying down. Bless God. Oh, for the baby's sake. See, we put up with a lot of physical inconveniences in order to bring the baby to birth. What about the vision? When we receive the vision from God, we have to be prepared to flow against the tide. There is a whole lot of miscarriages taking place in many people's vision because they lack the stamina. They lack the pull to push through. A lot of people give up the same message after some time and say they don't have the stamina. And they will easily throw it aside. Perhaps you're struggling with your house rent, you're struggling with your food, or paying your food bills. And you're about to say, I don't think this works. My friend, your struggle is not good enough. Your fight is not good enough. You have to fight under the time. I remember I was exercising the same message and I don't have money to pay for my lunch. Did I believe the same message? Yes, I do. I say it is established in God's Word. I remember when I had to preach in a Presbyterian church when I was in Sinai. And I believe in the same message, I, what I believe and what I said I say for, God will provide. And I had no money for the bus fare and I walked all the way to the church. But I never gave up. Never gave up the vision. I remember when the Lord called me to the ministry. And oh, I thought it was going to be easy, but it was not. I remember when I was given a last foot of fellowship and I left the seminary with just a suitcase of, of my clothing and a box of books. I had nowhere to go. And I remember when I was preaching the word of God and I said that I believe it's God's will for the people to be healed, for the people to prosper. And every other voice said, no, it couldn't be you think it was easy? It was not. And I remember when your name becomes infamous and people call you all kinds of things. We could have given up. Say no. Because we must not let go of the vision that God has given. Because the challenges will come and the thing after you have lived in a vision of for a while you realize that it's being misunderstood because you see things that other people don't see. And because you prepare for things that other people don't prepare. Getting physically pregnant, everybody can see it. 
Is that what you're expecting? Yes, of course. Then what do you think is it? Right? But getting spiritually pregnant, nobody else can see. They, can't, they only think that you have suddenly become queer, peculiar. Right? They cannot come to you and say, You're spiritually pregnant, brother. Amen. Nine months. They can't, and that's the problem. They can't see. Only those, see, those people in the street can see. Let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 26. Some points of having a vision, and having a vision that God has for our lives. My friends, when you have the vision and you see the vision being birthed forth, you feel that, that, like the mother who has carried the baby for nine months. And then God brings that little baby, or the doctor, the nurse carries a little baby, and place a little baby in your arms, and you held the baby and you look at it, it was all worth it. It was all worth the sleepless night. It was all worth the discomfort on your back. It was all worth the special foods and those special symptoms that do come. You pray, and you had a little baby. That's how it felt. Sometimes you feel like crying, sometimes you feel like laughing. But there's an inner peace and joy. And you must know how I felt when I see those children performing. Say, God. For, for, for most of them, it's only about one year, two years. But for me, it's been three years. From the time when we had just my wife teaching and experimenting in the school, it's been three years. Finally, after three years, you get five or six students. But in your heart, even though that baby is six pounds, five pounds, you say, Praise God, it's a little baby. But, and you know that little baby's gonna grow. And continue to grow. It's important to have the vision. You've got the book of Acts, chapter 26. Paul says here in verse 19 Therefore, King Agrippa. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent unto God and do work befitting repentance. Notice he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles. There are four separate places. And each one of those places have a different, different set of rules that govern the vision. If you trace what Paul said, in Acts, hold your place there in Acts 26 and turn to the book of Acts chapter 9. He says, I declare that vision in Damascus. I saw Jesus. He is the Messiah. Look at Paul's reception in Acts chapter 9. It says here in verse 19 and 20, When he had received food, he was strengthened then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who call on this name in Jerusalem? And has come here by for that purpose, so that he might bring those bound, them bound to the chief priests? 
But Saul increased all the more in strength. Now this is stage one of having the vision. He increased all the more in strength. When the vision comes to you, you suddenly have more strength. And he confounded the Jews to dwell in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now remember what I said in point one, you got to flow against the tide. In verse 23, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Every vision that I have ever had from God, the devil would send some circumstances to kill that vision. I have never had any vision that the devil has never opposed it to Venemia. Because he comes to see, kill, and destroy. He knows that if he could burn that vision, it would affect the lives of millions. You have to be prepared for the Damascus experience, flowing against the tide. You have to wrestle with forces that will kill the vision in your life. It's come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the first phase of having the vision. Isn't the first phase of having a pregnancy period keeping the child? More and more society progresses because of a combination of factors. Miscarriages are becoming more and more common. But it shall not be in the house of God and in the family of God's people. Amen. We are redeemed from the curse of the Lord. But isn't that the first stage of keeping the child? The forces that seek to destroy the child. That is why the doctors tell you after a certain stage, although at all stages miscarriages is possible, but it's in the early stages. After a certain stage is hooked up properly and uh, the chances of that happening completely diminishes. That's the first stage. The Damascus stage. You're flowing against the tide. And your life is strong. And all you have for your room, for your vision. You know how big is the room for your vision? Your vision is as big as the universe. But you've got to have a vision as big as the universe in a little basket. Look at Acts chapter 9. They had to let Paul down in a large basket. Not a little basket. Oh, he got a large basket. wonder whether he was chubby too, right? Verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down to the wall uh, in a large basket. And it's big enough for him and maybe some other camelouch uh, or whatever, camouflage. And then he was let down in a little basket all because he had a vision. And he told that vision. And his vision was big enough for the whole world. What was his vision? God said that you will reach to all the nations of the world. God says you'll be a light to the Gentiles. And you'll be before kings and priests and before the people of Israel. You shall testify before kings. It was a big vision and his vision affects our life. Paul's vision that is successful affects our life today when you read the New Testament. But the only room he had with a big vision was a little, I call it a little basket. What's the basket? Well, you have to make do with what you have. Thank God for the little basket. But you're going against the tide. Then the next place that Paul found difficulty in the vision was in the second place, he says, in Jerusalem. Look over at the book of Acts 9. Verse 26. When Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to tell them about the vision. He tried to join them. But nobody wants him. Your first struggle is that the vision is... The devil seeks to kill that vision in your life. The second struggle is for that vision to be accepted by the family of God, the church and believers. You would think that would be easy. It's not as easy, my friend. 
Even today, while our ministry circulates thousands of tapes and books all over the world, and almost in every region you go, people hear of this ministry. Yet in our very own city, we do not have full acceptance. We are accepted to a certain extent and we have been given the right hand of fellowship only because they cannot afford to reject you. But you know that the acceptance is not full, fully full-hearted. But praise God, the majority in the body of Christ are being affected and are accepting. But here is where you don't worry about the acceptance. You only be concerned about your obedience. Because acceptance from God and from man is in the control of God. And remember that it takes time for the body of Christ to accept the vision you have. I mean, when Christina was here sharing, I know her when she was much, what did I say, younger or smaller or whatever. She looks like a timid little girl. Yes, Paul, she does. I knew her longer than you. (laughs) But you will know her closer than me. (laughs) A little timid girl. Very polite. Very discreet. Like Susan. (laughs) Still is, yes. And nobody would believe that she could be a preacher if you saw her. Nobody will believe. But now when you hear her speak, you say, Wow, I believe she can preach. <laughs> the way she preach. Praise God, you know. I mean, we need salvation for England. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wonder whether Paul has something to do with that. Right? <laughs> I will realize. You see, it takes time for the body of Christ to accept you. But let God bring the acceptance. Don't push your way, don't push your name. And I take delight when I see Christina and I say, praise God. And you should hear her sing. I mean, she can really sing. She sings with a tape. But if I were to tell somebody... Ten years ago, and Christina can sing for the Lord. She can sing high notes. Huh? She can sing. You wouldn't believe it. Say, no, I cannot lie. No. How can she? Because it takes time for that to happen. And incidentally, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why I should share too much of you, right? Anyway, you help the others, right? Uh, I remember her before she met Paul. And before Paul found her. Right? I think the correct statement is Paul's eyes were open to her. <laughs> she was there all the time. Right? And and I, I, I just want to share a little bit, just to encourage some of you sisters who are looking for life partners. I remember, I mean, when her family got anxious. <laughs> Let's get her married. Let's get her married. <laughs> and everybody get anxious. Wait, God's time. God's purpose. Paul is glad that she had waited. Right? My, I, know, I know their family. I'm close to their family. And I know the pressure was intense on her. And look, you know, look, I'm counting the calendar. Now we are past counting the calendar, we are counting the uh, months. Now we are past counting the months, we are counting the weeks. Wait. No sweat. But it's the father and mother who sweat. And then it's the good friends with good intentions but doing the wrong things who sweat. Say, Faster. Faster, and Christian said, Faster what? Faster get married. You pass certain age, you may never meet the right one. Who says? Who says? If the who who says is not God, don't worry. 
Never worry. Worry is not of God. It's of man. And then just within a short time, right? It was a real short romance, although they know each other. Right. And then it goes dun 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 dun. I'm so glad to conduct their wedding. Hallelujah. And there she is. Leo. Praise the Lord. That's the end of the story. <laughs> you can hear the rest from them, right? But I just want to say that statement because sometimes I see sometimes sisters and all that get anxious when they reach a certain age or family members again. Don't be anxious. Just do God's will. And, 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 and even brothers, some brothers also, modern brothers, get anxious. <laughs> right? Counting their hands on their head. Right? They also get anxious. Don't get anxious. Just do God's will. And serve God faithfully. And um, praise the Lord. And don't, don't worry about your future. God will take care of that. Right? We are a good church here. You know? If whatever happens, we will take care of you. Right? Okay? The church will take care of you. Right? In some way. Some way. Right? Some way. Some place. And some of you who are older. And you know, you're wondering why oh, I got none of my children taking care of me. Don't worry, this is a family church, right? Right? We, we'll seek somehow, some place, and somewhere, some means to take care. That's what a family of God is for. And that's our vision, that's our concept. Praise the Lord. Better change the subject. <clears throat> we were speaking about the vision. And how when I see Christian, I say, praise God, God has really changed her. But getting people to accept her in the early days is not easy. But it's easy for people to accept you once your gift is seen. But the problem is that God starts working in your life before the gift is seen. And you're supposed to be faithful. Your second struggle in having a vision is to be able to reach a point where the body of Christ and the family of God accept you. For Paul, it was a long and windy road. It's a long road to freedom. A long, long road. And when Paul first went to the disciples, everybody rejected him but one person called Barnabas. And Barnabas is like Pastor Barnabas. In fact, Pastor Barnabas is like Barnabas. So, that's why he got his name, Barnabas. Son of Consolation. He's such an encouraging person. Praise God. I think the testimony he shared, if it was some of you guys who had come across a little man and a motorbike knocked you or something, uh, and, and, and you help this person all the way, get yourself drenched, and you're in the right, he's in the wrong, and you're sitting there, and uh, this motorbike guy fires you twice. If he were with any other person but Pastor Barnabas, you would have taken your M16. <laughs> hey, look, at you, I'm happy with you now. No. And, and you will fire that person back. But not Pastor Barnabas. <laughs> So sweet and gentle. And uh, it was only Barnabas in the Bible who believed in Paul. Took Paul in, listened to him, and brought him to the apostles. But I want you to know that even though he was accepted among the apostles, it took time for him to be accepted with the rest of the body of Christ and with the world at large. Because after that second round, it was like one round finished in Damascus, then a second round began in Jerusalem. And we are told in verse 28 of Acts 9, He was with them at Jerusalem coming in and out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Hellenes, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Look at the return. Again, they tried to kill him. That first struggle still in the shadow. But now he got brethren. At least some brethren accepted him. But it took some time before that full brethren accepted him. 
And uh, so in Paul's statement, Acts 26 verse 20, he says, he declared it first to Damascus, that is his first struggle, and in Jerusalem, his struggle for acceptance. In and among the important people in the body of Christ. Right? It's just like, it's just like, let me illustrate, it's just like being accepted by the leadership, but not being accepted by the congregation. And it can be that way. Sometimes, sometimes uh, you have a vision and you have a gift of God and perhaps the key leaders in the place saw the gift and got you in but the rest do not accept it. And it takes time for the rest to accept it. And it grows. But you are given some opportunities because the leaders believe in you. But the real acceptance comes much later which came in Paul's life in the book of Galatians, we are told. Let's look at the book of Galatians. See, what we are preaching is in line with with all that has been going on throughout the service and it's just one whole service orchestrated by the Holy Ghost, including the message. It just flows. And here in Galatians, chapter... One verse eighteen. After three years, I went out to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Then verse twenty-two. I was unknown by faith. So the rest of the place, the the the, the areas do not know him. So he had only the second type of the second struggle was acceptance by the family of God, and we can qualify that as the family of God, the leaders in the family of God. It takes time for leaders to recognize you. Sometimes it's the opposite. The congregation recognizes you, but leaders don't recognize you. Sometimes it's the leaders recognize you, congregation don't recognize you. You can see the struggle in many places, in many churches, in many fellowships. But the third struggle is for the, all the, lead, for the leaders and the body of Christ to accept you. It took Paul 14 years. In chapter 2, verse 1. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation. By that time, Paul's name was a household word throughout all the region. He has reached stage 3 of Acts 26. Acts 26, verse 20. And throughout all the region of Judea. So that whenever Paul's name was mentioned, they know and they heard. Even places where Paul has not traveled. Let me give an example here. You notice in Acts 28, when uh, Paul went to Rome for the first time, it says here in verse uh, 21, And they said to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you, but we desire to hear from you what you think for concerning this sect, concerning this sect, that is concerning this group, the Christians were called a sect in that time, we know they have spoken again everywhere. Look at Acts 28 verse 22. It doesn't mean that if you are doing God's will, that, that you are going to have a good name everywhere. I want you to know that throughout the whole revival in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 5, and Acts chapter 13, and onwards right up to Acts 28, there was a full-fledged Holy Ghost revival inclusive of Acts 19. But yet in Rome, which was the center of government, it says, everywhere we have heard people speak against this group. So don't, don't, don't get intimidated when people without facts say, I know a lot of people are against this, against that, against this. Because there's a never-ending story until Jesus comes. I mean, if we were there in Rome at that time, you would think, with all this revival taking place, everybody would be speaking well. Not so, my friend. They are actually living in the book of Acts. Right where Pentecost fell. Many years before. Right where in Jer- right, uh, and right there in the generation when X3 took place when the man was healed. 
And why impose ministry time? Everywhere, they're spoken again. And that's why, don't get intimidated when you travel anywhere and you find that either people love us or they hate us. It's hard to be neutral. Because this is revival. This is what God is doing all over the world. And the thing is, most of what is spoken are baseless. Uh, some people get intimidated. I don't know what they're looking for. They're just looking for religion or just Christianity. Oh, just a good church that nobody will criticize. There's none. There's none. The most important thing is to be in God's will and to do what God tells us to do and be faithful to Jesus under His coming. But even though that was happening in a general sense, Paul's ministry was well known. Look at him coming to, coming back to Jerusalem in the book of Acts chapter 21. Verse 21. 20, 20 and 21. Acts 21 verse 20 and 21. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they, they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the custom. Now you and I know that Paul didn't do that. Because he himself circumcised Timothy in Acts 16. You and I know he never do that. But as usual, people misquote. Now Paul may have said some things like that. Because you read Galatians, you can see him saying, that circumcision doesn't avail anything. So people can take, perhaps he's preaching a message like, he, like the message he wrote in, to, get to, to the Galatians. And if that Galatian epistle was preached, some people who were there would hear portions of it and think that Paul is actually against circumcision, but he's not. He's talking to the Gentiles in the context. Every public speaker and every preacher knows how easy it is for people to misquote you. Even Jesus was misquoted. Remember the false witnesses, what they accused him of? They said, this man said that he will destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. He didn't say that. He said that destroy this temple and in three days time, I will raise it up. He never said that he will destroy. That was an addition. Secondly, he was talking pictorially. He was not talking about the physical temple, he was talking about his temple, but people didn't understand the parables he spoke. So that's where we realize that everywhere his ministry was known. The most important thing is not whether people speak for him or against him. It's that everyone knows that Paul is a figure to be, to be contended with. In other words, if you live in that Christianity generation, whether you like it or not, you've got to confront what he teach and what he believes in because of his vision. You're a force to be contended with. And that's what revival is about. You're a force to change society. The first struggle is in yourself. The vision to be birthed or to be aborted. The second is acceptance by key leaders. Third is acceptance by the general body of Christ. And you never get 100% acceptance, but you get what I call the majority acceptance. But the vast majority of people realize this is God. And they cannot deny that you are God. So don't worry, some of you who are new in the ministry and you've got some revelation, some things that are in line with the word, you start teaching and sharing them and some people say, hey, this is heresy, you look like, you, you sound and look like a false prophet. Don't worry about that. Let that give establish you and one day it bears fruit. People cannot deny this is God. The fourth level of acceptance and let's look at the book of Acts 26 again. Acts 26 It tells us here Paul says Verse 19, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, in Jerusalem, throughout all the region of Judea, and the last one, 
and to the Gentiles. What happened? Paul fourth step, his fourth struggle. He began to do things that the church in his time never do. Not all the leaders in his time, not all the people in that time. The fourth struggle is to break new ground. That's not easy either. See, it was not Peter, the apostle who reached to the Gentiles, it was Paul. See, your first struggle is in yourself. Your second struggle is for acceptance. Your third struggle is for the whole church at large to accept you. Your fourth struggle is when you're going to do something that the church in your day have never done before, but it's God who is advancing the church through you. My, 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 it's going to be one of the biggest. And every other struggle before that is only preparing you. Because you're breaking new ground that nobody else has broken before. Nobody else dare to reach the Gentiles openly the way Paul reached out to. Any Gentile outreach was coincidental or sort of uh, minimal. They avoid it as much as possible. But Paul went all out to reach to the Gentiles. Peter only was called to Cornelius and he went there because he couldn't help it. God sent him specially. And the revival in in Antioch is only incidentally some of the Gentiles got to know the church and the church was set up. But there was none like Paul that targeted the Gentiles as a missionary group and went for them. And he went all the way. And it was a great struggle. And one of his biggest struggle, struggle can be symbolized in Galatians chapter 2, where he even has to go beyond the leadership in his time, in his revelation. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came... He withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was shaken. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why do you compare Gentiles to live as Jews? In other words, Sometimes, when you're at a false struggle, you even have to correct and go beyond what everybody else is saying and doing. But you know that it's in the Bible and it's in the Word of God. That's your security. Not talking about purposely doing things like that. But there are truths in this Bible that sometimes established leaders don't recognize. But five years down the road, ten years down the road, it will become popular. But the thing about a pioneer and a visionary is that you do it not because it's popular, you do it because it's right. That's having a vision. Our question to you is, do you really have the vision? When you really have it, you will pursue it through all those four struggles. And our big second point is flowing with the vision. That is, when somebody else is having the vision, we need to know how to flow with it. We need to know how to cooperate with that vision. And that, I'll just give you the points without elaborating on them. Turn to the book of Acts. And let's look at a person called Barnabas and how he flowed with the vision and pick up principles from his life. How to flow with a vision. Because people are taught how to have a vision, but we must also be taught how to flow with a vision. When perhaps it's somebody else's vision that we are helping to fulfill, we need to know how to flow with it. The book of Acts, chapter 4. Now, in verse 32 to 37, the Holy Spirit was having a different way of move. In this move, 
everybody was selling their things and their land and possessions and bringing it to the church. It was a major move at that time. A big revival of helping one another. And uh, in verse 34, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and through the proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement and leave out the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it to the apostles' feet. Number one. Number one is to help pay the price for the vision. How to flow with the vision. Number one, help pay the price. Now Barnabas own land. And when you saw everybody doing it, now he didn't just do it because everybody do it. But he realized this is God and he could be a part of it. And he wants to be a part of it. How does he be a part of it? He paid for the price to be part of the vision. So his name is included here. Why is his name included here? I believe he may have paid one of the largest prices. Not because he was an Ananias and Sapphira who won recognition, but because he really believed in it and he was prepared to pay the price for the vision and not only let the people who had the vision pay the price, he was to be among those who contribute to the vision and take part of the burden of the vision. Number two, and that story takes us to the book of Acts chapter 9. In verse 26, 27. Now God was doing a new thing but nobody knew it. He said, what do you mean brother God was doing a new thing? God had just saved Saul and three years later he came to Jerusalem. Nobody had heard of Saul and his name was Paul later. And in Paul was a new wave and a new move. But nobody could see that, that, that new wave and a new move in Paul. Only Barnabas saw it. Only Barnabas saw it. And while everybody was afraid of him, Barnabas was the only one not afraid of any new move of God. He took the initiative to find out for himself to search it out, to make friends with Paul, and then he introduced him to the apostles. Point two in how to flow with the vision, work behind the sin. Because you cannot have two visions at the same time. When you're flowing, you see, although I may have visions, and my own visions that God called me to fulfill, when I work in an organization, let's say ICFM or in another organization, which I'm supposed to be a, a small part in the big, bigger vision, I will seek to flow with that vision when I'm there. Which is why, if you remember in the early days of the church, we started the FCM and uh, Fellowship of Charismatic Ministers. And uh, we, we interdenominational pastors uh, meeting. And, uh, and then, after two years, then we stopped. Why did we stop? Because I was called to help in the ICFM. And I knew in my heart, it's not right to help two ministers conference. Because I will have an ICFM conference, and then I have an own ministers conference, and there was a conflict of interest. Because if I'm promoting both, it's difficult. If I promote this one, it will cause the other to suffer. If I promote this, the other will suffer. So I say, no, as long as I'm serving here, I will not pursue that vision. I will give up that vision for some time, put it on the shelf and later revive it. But I will give my heart to this vision to promote the ICFM. In other words, I learned to work behind the scene instead of working on my own vision, work on somebody's vision. To work behind the scene for another person's vision, another, another force, another vision that, that somebody else conceived among the ICFM directors in the United States. I put aside my own vision. Until and when I completed my job, then can I go on to that. So number two, learn to work behind the scene. There are too many people who want to have their own vision who don't le learn to work for another person's vision. Or while they're working for another person's vision, they're only looking for opportunities as stepping stones. That's not right. How would you like to take an employee who is all the time looking for another greener place to work for? 
You wouldn't want that person. You want loyalty. So it's important. Number two, learn to work behind the scene and support another vision. Barnabas was behind working and he was a great part. God used him. Barnabas never got any credit in that sense, although the Bible, Holy Ghost recorded him for our teaching. But the body of Christ at large didn't know what he did. Nobody else knew what he did. Just like some of the video men, some of our other ministry of help. I mean, they're doing work behind the scene, cleaning out the place, setting out the whole thing, carrying those things here and there. They're working for somebody else's vision. How would you like to be a people who sell the equipment but not be the singer? You're not the one who everybody hears and the singing and the worship. And praise God. That's wonderful. What a gift. But many people don't see those people handling behind the scene, you know, coming early hours, setting up and all that. Although they may have a voice like a frog, but they may be prince coming in disguise. Because the frog hasn't grown up yet. Although Jeremiah was a bullfrog. But yet, one day, the frog turns out to be a prince. A singer, you never know. All the time learning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to know how come these kind of things happen at the right time. <laughs> Amazes me sometimes. But the second part is learn to work behind the scene. The third part, Acts chapter 11. How to flow with the vision. Acts 11. And we see here in uh, verse 21 onwards, Acts 11, verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all, that with purpose of heart they would continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed to Tarsus to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The third area in flowing with the vision is learning to put somebody else first before you. Learning to play second fiddle. Now, it, it's slightly different from, different from uh, the second point. The second point, you're behind the scene all the time. In the third point, you are also seen. I mean, if, if you are one of the fiddlers and you're playing second fiddle, you can be seen. People can see you. Barnabas now can be seen. His ministry also took off and he was in a very prominent position. But while he was prominent, this is the third point which is very important. He knew what he can do and what he can't do. Because he was one of those people who know that he's not the, the guy who can preach the way Paul can preach. He can exhort, he can comfort, he can encourage, but he cannot do what Paul did. His gift was different. And it takes a gentleman, and it takes humility. I'm sure he's going to have great rewards in heaven. To say that, I know this is not my department, I really can't do this, I must get somebody else. Look at him. I mean, I mean he was such a gentleman. Even though he can't, he, he know, he know there's a need, and the need is so great, he didn't try to do something he can't. And he know that if he bring Paul, Paul may outshine him. And Paul did. All the time Paul kept outshining him because Paul was a public figure. We were gift in the public in the area of publicity. And Paul outshone him. But did Barnabas feel uncomfortable? Never. Never. He learned how to give first place and take second place when necessary. Third point, he learned how to play second fiddle when necessary. He was not going to be insecure or threatened. Because they know somebody else can do that job. Better than him and he's willing to go all the way to find someone there. Knowing, knowing this. That if Paul succeeded, he may be, he may be removed. 
right? They may not need him anymore. But he's never insecure. That's the wonderful thing about him. Fourth and last point in flowing with the vision is found in the book of Acts chapter 15. Verse 39. Then the contention between Paul and Barnabas became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Now in the apocryphal writings called the Gospel of Barnabas, I think, it writes about this incident and it, and it adds more pictures to it. Paul, did, Paul and Barnabas didn't quarrel and, and then they departed in a very, uh, off, in a very uh, gruesome manner. Gruesome? Praise the Lord. Hi there. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, what happened was that Paul and uh, Barnabas, after they disagree, in the Gospel of Barnabas, in the Apocrypha writings, they talk about how they cried, they wept, they prayed together, they knelt down, and then they blessed one another and they parted. It's a nice story there. Number four. When you flow with your vision, nowhere, nowhere to end and let the other person go on without you. It's hard to let go. Isn't it, parents, when your children have grown up, they pass the age of 21 and you're still clinging on to them. And you keep giving justification and excuses. You say, oh, they still need me. They still need me. Actually, you still need them. It's you who feel more insecure than them. They're asking for independence. They're, they're asking to find out their own life. And you hold on to them. It's hard to let go, isn't it, parents? But if God leads them in a certain direction... You must learn to let go. Otherwise, you rob them of their future. Number four, my numbers learn how to let go so that Paul can grow bigger without him. Because now Barnabas is, is reaching a point where he's, he can be a hindrance to Paul. You know why? Barnabas in the ministry is older than Paul. And all the time, whatever Paul does, Barnabas actually is a senior person to him. And as long as he's there, his shadow is there, Paul cannot grow out. Or the shadow of the Paul's light was shining brighter. It's important to learn how to take your shadow away from people's life so that they can be seen without you. Otherwise, people will think they cannot do it without you. And that's the thing that I love to do. Sometimes when I go to a convention, we're going again in April next year to Sabah. And I say, look here, I could come and do conventions every year. We have a great time. And I'll, and I'll continue to be well known and everybody will know my ministry. But wait, that's not my vision. My vision is not fame. Because if that was my vision, I would never have served God. Before God called me, I had two, two things, fortune and fame. I wanted to study accountancy, to handle money, earn lots of money, and I wanted to be the first grandmaster so I could have be famous. If I wanted that, I wouldn't have served God. If there was any fame or any provision, it's only coincidental. I said, no, that's not what I want. I'm not trying to establish my ministry. My ministry is to raise up other ministry. And what I want to do if I go, people will come because they're here and there. But I want them to hear these other ministries. Whom I know are ready to be launched out. And then they'll say, hey, these people can do it too. Let's have a convention with them and I'll be glad. Learn how to take your shadow away from people's lives whom you have helped. You see, when you have helped someone all your life, do you know what the danger is? People will think they cannot succeed without you. 
Right. And you know that they actually can because you have worked closely with them. And so that's when you say, I think that it's time and they are able to grow forth and go forth. And you take your shadow so that everybody can realize it is actually their ministry. And I remember, you know, in the early days when we started the second church, uh, first was in Penang, second was here. And every time the church name was mentioned, it was always uh, Mr. So-and-so plus you. But every time they hear the church, they don't know me, they know that person too. And I was like in the shadow. It's fine, it's God's will for me to be there for a moment of time. And then it was time to come out of that shadow. To come out under those wings and launch out. So that people will know it's your ministry that God has called you to. And your ministry is not the, the result of another man's ministry. It's the result of your own call that God has for your life. So the fourth import is important. When you build another person's vision, learn how not to overshadow the person, but learn how to take off your own shadow so that the other person can go forth. Praise God. Flowing with the vision. Amen. We have to learn to how to have the vision, go through all those four struggles, and learn how to flow with the vision in all those four steps in the life of Barnabas. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have called us and you have chosen us, O oh Lord, we are the people of vision. And we know your Holy Spirit has poured forth visions into each one of our lives. Dream dreams, prophecy. Things, O oh God, that you have spoken in our lives to fulfill and to do. And we know, Lord, that the most important thing in this life is to do your perfect will. It's not to do anything to please anyone or to do anything or find favor with men, but to please God and find favor with men as a result. We thank you, O God, that you give favor with God and with men. And we know, O God, that the most important thing in our life is to be able to one day stand before you at your throne and say, we have done all that you commanded us to do. We are only your servants to do your will. Oh Father, I pray for each one here under the sound of my voice. I know, oh God, that you have given visions to each one here, Lord. Callings and purposes higher than what we can dream of. And oh God, we also know the progression of visions. And we pray, O oh God, that every single vision that you see into each heart will be able to take off, bear fruit, and be like a mighty tree that the birds of the air can come and rest in its branches. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Establish it, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise and sing that song. Um, what's the vision song? Um, we have a vision yeah okay for this land we share a dream for this land we my faith is big revival to this land For this nation We shall dream For this land Angel Celebration my faith is big revival to this land. Every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow, worship you. Every time confess you are Lord. Open heaven. This nation, every knee shall bow and worship you. Every tongue confess, 
never been born again and today you want to be born again right now is the time as you sing that song come quickly right out to my left here we'll pray with you give me your friend ask your friend to come to the front and if you are also here and you have a vision in your heart in your life maybe the vision died somewhere along the way maybe discouragement will fail you and you need that fire to come right back into your life you come right up. Whichever portion of you are at the vision and whichever struggle stage you are, we want to pray with you because that vision must not die. Every vision means souls to the Lord. Every unfulfilled vision means a part of God's will not fulfilled. In the end, somebody else will have to pick up that vision too to do God's will. Hallelujah. We have a vision. God is nation. We share a dream for this land. Celebration by faith is a revival to this land. I where you are right now we're going to pray for you corporately together The fire of God is coming back into your life right now. Burning fire of God. Oh Lord, kindle the vision of fresh in your life and our Lord. No, oh Lord God, my Almighty, seal that vision into each life, oh God. 
Lord, I pray you pour hot oil, burning oil of fire upon his heart and his life, O oh God. Take the clothes from the tombs of the things in heaven, O oh Lord, and place it upon their spirits, O oh God. Let a coal of fire burn, O oh God, with fire from the altar of God in heaven. Lord, let a fire burn in their lives. That they will never ever more give up, Lord. But they will have such stamina come upon their lives. And such long suffering and perseverance. I pray, O oh Lord, that you impart perseverance upon each other in life. So that they will be prepared, Lord, to do anything, to pay any price. In order to fulfill the vision and the call of God on their lives. So seal it, O oh Father God. In this life, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering. God bless you. Amen.